and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study. So thankful to be with you and glad we have this opportunity to study from the book of God. Uh, we spent some time in the book of Ephesians and uh, uh, of course we finished that study and of course if you're watching this on the video you know that you can have access to uh, the previous videos. You can just go uh, there on the YouTube page and I've, in fact, I've got a little section set up. It's all from the book of Ephesians. You can go back and look at those uh, as you'd like to. What I'd like for us to do is begin a, a series of studies actually concerning all of the churches of the first century. And as you can see from the scroll here, uh, we're going to talk about the, book, the church at Jerusalem. Uh, and we're going to begin that in, in this program. So... Uh, I don't know, after uh, talking about Ephesians and after studying that in some depth, I thought, you know, it'd be good for us to go back and really to look at a, at several of the churches, really. And what I'd like for us to do, and kind of map this out, what I'd like for us to do is to uh, talk about, obviously, the Church of Jerusalem, but go from Jerusalem, go through the book of Acts, talking about several of the churches. And also include in this a study from the seven churches of Asia as well. There are also, of course, churches that were in existence in the first century. So I want us to go through those as well. Uh, the intention of this is going to be that we will look at the uh, city if as, as is appropriate, whether it's the city like uh, Jerusalem, obviously, or a city like Ephesus, a city like Colossae, and so forth or the region around there, to get a kind of a background on the geography, get a background on some of the history of those folks and what they came out of in order to become Christians. And then obviously we're going to talk about the church there and what we find as, uh, as is revealed in the Scripture. And also as appropriate, we will uh, hone in on the letters that were uh, they're written to the various churches. And so the intention of this study ultimately is to get a good, really overall view of the New Testament by the end of it. And I recognize that there are several churches, uh, all my hundreds of churches really that are mentioned in the New Testament when you think about it. But I'm, I'm going to focus on churches that uh, God spent time talking about. And he gave us insight into the people. He gave us insight into some of the workings that were going on how folks were converted, and so on and so forth. And so that'll really narrow our scope down. It won't be hundreds and hundreds, uh, obviously, but it, it'll be a dozen or so, I guess, maybe a little over a dozen churches that are talked about in the New Testament, and again, with their appropriate letter, appropriate epistle, when that uh, is happens. And uh, then just kind of go from there and see the kind of things we can learn, see things we can apply to ourselves and apply to our lives, okay? And so that's really going to be the intention. That's really going to be the plan here for the next little bit. And I thought I'd kind of lay some groundwork on this. And we will get to Jerusalem, I promise. But where I want us to think about for a moment is this. And here on this map that you see before you, uh, it, to me, this map is fascinating. Because what it covers, if you look carefully at this, this covers basically the entirety of the Bible. The Bible was written uh, in the land of the Middle East, and uh, God's people went down into Egypt. Uh, they're just past the Nile Delta, and you can see the Nile Delta there uh, toward the bottom of the map. Obviously, that largest section of blue there, that's the Mediterranean Sea. And so all around there, uh, uh, kind of a backward sea, you come out of Egypt and, and kind of that backward sea right there, they'll come up on into uh, Israel come up into that area called Canaan, or the Promised Land. And then what we find is, uh, in the New Testament, God's people, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, that you're going to go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so what happened here is that God's people did that very thing, and, and Christians left, and they went uh, you know, north, south, east, and west. And, but the majority of what the Bible talks about and the Bible history is going to talk about how these people went north and then headed west over from Asia Minor, what's called Asia Minor today, and modern-day Turkey and, and areas such as this. 
and across and on over into Italy. And you look over there, you can see the boot. Uh, so there's there's Italy, uh, you know, Rome, Italy, and so forth. And so they're going to go from there. And so the Bible covers or talks about a section here that is a section of the world, really, that's quite unique because uh, in a you know, in, in a manner of speaking, a short period of time, I know it's it's not, but uh, in in relative terms, it didn't take that long, a uh, few thousand years, and God's word has spread on at least three continents. And in this map, what you're looking at, you're looking at an aerial view. Uh, you might say from, well, aerial, obviously, but from space, you're looking at three continents. You're looking at Asia, you're looking at Europe, and you're looking at Africa. And so three continents there where God's word was spread. And uh, like I said, it's just amazing to think about all the history, amazing to think of all the things that's taken place. And of course, you can zoom in a little closer. And when you do, what you're going to see is that there is uh, Jerusalem proper and there is Israel as, as a nation or Canaan. And then whenever you think about um uh, well, whenever you think about what's going on there, oh my, all the history that's taken place in that situation. And here's the Lord who has come and and died on the cross. He has lived and, and died within this section that you're looking at. He lived 33 years within the boundaries of this section right here. And then, uh, of course, to the as you're as you're looking at it to the left, it would obviously be to the to the west. But if you're looking at it from our perspective, there's the Mediterranean Sea. Over to the right, you're going to see the Jordan River. Uh, up there toward the top is the Sea of Galilee, and you come on down, and finally down into the Dead Sea there at the bottom. And so, north, south, east, and west, right there, this is the area that uh, the Lord lived in. And this is where we're going to start. Because here the Bible talks about the fact that the church would have its beginnings in Jerusalem. And so that's what I want us to think about here for the next little bit is the churches of the first century. And specifically, we're going to be talking about the church, obviously, at Jerusalem. Well, in order to to understand that, to, to talk about um uh, where we need to go next, it, we need to go over to the book of Acts. And so in Acts chapter 2, you'll notice here the coming of the Holy Spirit is a subheading. That's a subheading put in there by man. But in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. Came a sound out, out of heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And in verse 4 it says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now who's talking about here are the apostles. Now we've had, obviously, a replacement for Judas with Matthias, and so now we have 12 apostles once more. And these 12 apostles here were filled with the Holy Spirit, it says. And whenever they uh, were filled, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And verse 5 says they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, about men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, verse 6, it says the multitude came together and were confounded. That means they were confused. They said, we hear every man speaking in our own language. That was something that was just amazing to them. And so what had happened was, the, they were amazed at the events taking place. We hear every man in our own language. They had gathered there on the day of Pentecost. They had expected to hear uh, you know, Aramaic. They had expected to hear the Jewish language, obviously. They had expected to hear that, and devout men out of every nation under heaven, they had to learn a second language. Uh, and so they had learned the Jewish language, as well as growing up in whatever area, country, wherever they lived. And then you find that these folks... Uh, not only was this the case, but these folks hear every man in our own language or in our own tongue. We hear them speaking in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Uh, there, verse number 11. This is the beginning of the church at Jerusalem. And I'm sure we're very familiar with this passage and very familiar with what's going on in Acts chapter 2. 
but it bears repeating that we might appreciate what's going on, okay? What I want us to do, now we kind of laid some groundwork, like I said. I want us to go back, if you will, go with me here uh, back to uh, our chart, and I want you to notice something with me. Here in our chart, you'll notice the following, Jerusalem. Well, it's probably one of the best known, I suggest to you, that it's one, probably one of the best known churches that there was. Of course, this is where it all began. Jesus had promised that a church, uh, he would build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18. He promised that that would take place, and it did. The gates of hell are Hades. Death itself, that's what Jesus was saying. I'm going to build a church, and death itself will not stop this event from happening. In fact, what we find is that death was necessary for it to happen. And so that's exactly what we see. So he, uh, Jesus, built a church. He died upon the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And the Bible says that as a result of these things, that now in Acts chapter 2, there's going to be that church being built. And from this would blossom all the various local congregations that we find all over uh, the, well, over the New Testament world and all over the world as far as that's concerned. This was something that was promised. Isaiah chapter 2 and there verses 2 and 4 talk about this. And where we find the, the promise that, uh, that in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established above the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And he said, all nations shall flow unto it. And that's exactly what we were reading from Acts chapter 2 and about the first six verses or so. He says here that it shall be the mountain of the Lord's house. The word mountain, uh, as actually the subject of that sentence, and of the Lord's house is a prepositional phrase modifying mountain. Mountain in the Bible, when not referring to an actual mountain, <laughs> uh, mountain uh, as a figurative term or symbolic term stands for government, stands for a kingdom. And so what he's saying basically is that God's going to establish a new kingdom. And he says it's going to start in Jerusalem. All nations shall flow unto it. And it says there's where the word of God will be spoken. And uh, the word of the Lord shall, st shall branch forth from Jerusalem. Well, that's exactly what happened. When you read Acts chapter 2, that's exactly what was promised. And so we find those promises being made in Isaiah 2 and Zechariah and uh, Daniel chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4 and, and all these places and now fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And that's why I say it's probably one of the better known or best known of the churches so far as that's concerned. And these people would be the ones responsible for spreading the gospel then all over the world. Of course, whenever persecution came, Acts chapter 8 and verse number 4, when persecution came, it says, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And we read about them once more in Acts 11, verse 29 to 31. Kind of pick up there after the conversion of Cornelius, kind of like meanwhile back at the ranch. And we find these folks who had been scattered abroad from Acts chapter 8, they're still spreading God's word far and wide. Oh yes, that, a lot of that was going on and, and so much of it was happening. There's a lot going on in Jerusalem. You know what? It's just an amazing, amazing study. And I hope that, that this, even so far, are things that will help you, will make you think, and, and will make you realize and appreciate just what was going on and how this fits into God's plan. But like I told you, I want us to back up and not only talk about the church, but I want to talk about some of the setting behind the church, some of those things uh, relative to uh, its history. And so start with the city with me. The city of Jerusalem is believed to be the ancient city of Salem. And, of course, that's where Melchizedek resided all those many years ago. You know it? And so you remember back in Genesis chapter 14 how that after Abram had spared or had rescued Lot, after that war had happened and the kings had taken Lot and his family hostage, and so Abraham has to go, or Abram at this point, has to go and he takes about 300 of his well-trained men, kind of like him and his own little army, that go off and go find Lot and bring him back. Well, whenever he comes back, 
Genesis chapter 14 talks about how that he, that is, uh, Abraham, paid tithes to Melchizedek and how the, that all of that was necessary that he might, uh, well, fulfill prophecy and even through the loins, and it, it would come out later on in in Bible history how that, you know, kind of like through the loins of Abraham, but it was Levi was was paying tithes to Melchizedek, and of course Jesus would be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and so forth. But what we find with Melchizedek is he was called king of Salem, or king of peace. And so this is where folks understood Melchizedek had come from, this place called Salem near Mount Moriah. And so that's what's going on here. Now, if you will, turn your attention back to the city for a moment. It was during the days of the Joshua and Judges, that's when the Jebusites, they had ruled in that place. And the Jebusites had ruled, had taken over that particular area at that time. Judges chapter 9, for example, talks about them, talks about the Jebusites, Judges chapter 1. And so these folks, and so you'll read about them quite a bit, the Jebusites and, and Jebusites in Salem and so forth. And you kind of, after a while, it kind of, uh, the words kind of mix and mingle and you end up with Jerusalem after a while. But finally, about 1000 BC, it was David who conquered that city. And he conquered that place. He conquered it. Second Samuel chapter 5 talks about this. And once he has conquered it, it's going to stay in the hands of the Jews then, what, for another thousand years anyway. Um, so from David's time all the way to Jesus' time, that's a thousand years right there, that it was pretty much in their hands. Um, again, Babylon took over, Assyria took it over, well, Assyria didn't take over then. Babylon took over the southern part where Jerusalem was. Assyria took over the northern part, the northern section. So Assyria never never conquered Jerusalem. Assyria didn't, but Babylon did. And then, of course, the Greeks, and, of course, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, Rome, so forth. But the Jews were always allowed to, to live there and to have that. And so that's, that's kind of why, why the confusion comes up a little bit later uh, with the Pharisees and all this and John... And chapter 8, whenever they tell Jesus, we've never been in bondage to any man. Well, yeah, you had. And in fact, uh, they were in bondage right then because Rome ruled and they didn't rule themselves. But be that as it may, Jerusalem had been in their hands there for another thousand years anyways. And it always had been uh, a part of their uh, history a part of their lineage. This was the place that you went to. This was the city that God had chosen for folks to have their, the Jewish people to have their feast, their three feasts every year. And you're supposed to go to Jerusalem in order to uh, partake in those major feasts and things. And so Passover feast and Pentecost and and, other, and they had so many things. And that's where the temple was going to be. And, and more on that in a moment. So you think about the city, you think about the terrain of the city. And I find this fascinating because this will connect with the Bible. You watch. They were about 33 miles west of the Mediterranean Sea. Not that far away from the Mediterranean. So you could go and just like, kind of like in that map that I showed you a while ago. They could go and be in the Mediterranean you know, in a short period of time to be there. Uh, 2,500 feet above sea level, uh, 3,700 feet above the Jordan River. Okay, now let that sink in. You got 2,500 feet. So there's a high elevation. Again, they're up on the mountain here. And so here they're up 2,500 feet above sea level, about half a mile, I guess, uh, and then 3,700 feet above the Jordan River on a major trade route so far as that's concerned as well. But here's here's where I said, this is where it comes into um, uh, well, biblical things. I want you to think about something for a moment. Whenever you go to Jerusalem, 
and it didn't matter what direction he came in from. When the Bible talks about people going to Jerusalem, what description was given? In other words, if you go to Jerusalem, what did you do? You remember? I'll give you a second. Remember what they did? You went up. I don't care if you were going north, south, east, or west to Jerusalem. You went up to Jerusalem. We have a tendency in our culture to think about north being up and south being down, you know, and uh, east and west, right and left. We kind of think in those terms a lot of times. Sometimes people will say that and it confuses folks. They'll say, now you need to turn east. You know, go down this road, turn east, and then turn, you know, and people go, I don't know what that means. Well, it's it's correlated to north, south, east, west, up, down, left, right. Now, they didn't do that in the Hebrew language, though. They didn't do that with, in the Bible. They spoke from ge geographical terms. So again, look at this list. We're 200, uh, sorry, 2,500 feet above the sea level, 3,700 feet above the Jordan River. Any direction you go to get to Jerusalem, geographically speaking, you're going to do what? See? Go up. You're going to go up to Jerusalem. And now, whenever you read the Bible, and whenever you read about folks and their travels and things, and you read about that, where they're going up, now you understand why. Because geographically speaking, it was always up. It's very, very high up, so far as that's concerned. And of course, during these days, oops, there's a there's another map right there, if you can see that very well. I had to kind of turn it on its side. But uh, there toward the top of the map from this angle, uh, you can see the temple, where the temple was, and the, there was the temple mount. There were the uh, various uh, places for the uh, Gentiles and places for the others, uh, courts of the women, the courts of the Gentiles, and so forth, and you just went further in. The closer in you got, the more it was uh, exclusive company. You know, finally, you got to just things that the Levites were doing. Now, and of course, you can kind of see this wall. Uh, that's that's what uh, you see on the outside outskirts of things, is this is this wall that was set up. You had the upper city and the lower city, and you had all this uh, here with, uh, and again, whenever you think about the terrain of the mountains and stuff, I mean, they just built on top of the mountains. So you had an upper city, and you had a lower city, because that's the way the mountains were. They didn't come in with big excavators and, you know, flatten it off. They just built uh, in accordance with how the shape of the, of the terrain was. But one thing about it, they had an upper marketplace, they had a citadel, they had the Acre. You can see all these things in this map. But during the time of Christ, they just had the three walls that were surrounding the city. And in fact, today, if you went to Jerusalem, you would, uh, there are scale models there that you can go look at, but, but the city of Jerusalem, just like any other city that you can think of, has expanded and expanded and grown and grown during time. And so it's not the same size. It's not the same as you think what Jesus would have would have been in, at least the size of the city. Um, it, it's much larger than it used to be. And so another thing was, they only had the three walls because on one side were impassable uh, valleys and other things like this. And just going with the terrain, you know, they figured, well, we'd be okay on that one side, and they just put walls around on the other sides so as to keep away the enemy and so forth, okay? I know I've spent a lot of time on that, and, and I hope I haven't bored you too much with it. Uh, this kind of thing I, I kind of get into because if I can understand this, if I can understand the history, like I said, going back to Genesis, this city has been around. If I can get into that and understand that, to me, it helps me understand the, the city, but it helps me understand the people and so forth as, as we think about them in the New Testament. So I hope this has helped you. But like I promised, we'll get into uh, here uh, the church in Jerusalem, okay? Now we'll get to some of the major things, and I'm, I'm not going to promise that we're going to be able to finish 
uh, at this time or not. We'll just see how we do on it, okay? But we're going to start anyways. We're talking about the church at Jerusalem, then obviously we're going to begin in Acts chapter 2. And we read part of this a moment ago. We find here that, that this church had its beginning when? Well, you already know the answer, don't you? When did the church have its beginning? Well, it had its beginning on the day of Pentecost, didn't it? Go to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, he said they were all with one accord and in one place. And so here the apostles were, and they were preaching. The Bible says that those folks were amazed. They heard every man in the tongue. He says, our own tongue wherein we were born. We heard every man. He says, we do hear them speak the wonderful works of God on this occasion, Acts 2, verse 11. Now, what that did was it, it gave power to, uh, and give credibility, I should say it that way, it gave credibility to Peter and to the other apostles that they were speaking the truth. Now, some people mocked them, made fun of them, didn't like what they had to say, and on, on, on. But Acts 2, verse 14 says, Peter, who was standing up with the eleven, he said, You men of Israel and all you that dwell in Judea and dwell at Jerusalem, he says, Be this known unto you, hearken unto my words. He said, We're not drunk. Some people mocked him and said, Ah, oh, they're drunk, something wrong with them. He said, No, he said, We're not drunk. He said, This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he starts quoting from Joel chapter 2. What happened here, he says, what's going on this day is something that Joel had promised. This is that which is promised. And so when you think about this is that, this is it. This is the thing. You want to be a part of, of a fulfillment of prophecy? You want to be, be a part of something that uh, it, it was spoken of, you know, 700 years ago? You want to be a part of something that was promised by God and we've been looking forward to now for centuries? This is that. This is the thing. This is the event. This is the time. And now you find him preaching. That is, Peter's sermon is the one that is recorded for us. So all of them, you notice here in verse 14, I'll go back to verse 14 real quick. Peter standing up with the 11. All 12 of them were preaching that day. But it is Peter's sermon that is recorded for us whenever we uh, hear, read, and study together. And I'd like to get into more detail with this, and, and certainly you're welcome to read all this. Read Acts chapter 2. Get a hold of it. Because he says these are the things that God uh, had intended for you to know and for these people to know. So he says in Acts 2 and verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. All right? Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved to God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. You know about this. You saw it. You were witness to it. He says, him, that's talking about Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, it was not possible that he should be holden of it. See that? And then he goes back to the Psalms and talks about what David had seen and what, what had happened some thousand years ago. He says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Yes, here's the promise. And the one who was to come. Here, here, so we got, got two things, really. Got two prophecies being fulfilled, if, if you want to look at it that way. You've had prophecies, more than one. Prophecy on Christ those have all been fulfilled. And now he says the thing that Joel said, it's been fulfilled. You're a witness to all of these things. You are a witness to this uh, here. And, you know, there's just no denying it. And so, as you continue to read down through here, he says, a men and brethren, uh, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David in Acts 2 verse 29. He is both dead and buried and his sepulcher with it, is with us till this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God hath with an oath swore to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. He seen these things before spake of the resurrection of Christ. Verse 31, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. 
And so he says the, the promise here was of Christ. And so finally, when you come down, he says, therefore, uh, let all the house of Israel, verse 36, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's what he said. And he said, now when they heard this, this is, this is Luke recording these words, when, when they, when the people heard this, heard what Peter had just been preaching, they were pricked in their hearts and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Now, like I told you all ago, Peter and everybody was preaching that day. And we saw it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. And we see it again in Acts 2 verse 37. They said, Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, all right, so Peter's going to give the answer. He's going to give the answer that we need to have. What are we going to do? What are we going to do about our sin? What are we going to do about killing Jesus? What are we going to do about this? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you come down to verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 souls saved that day. They were saved, and they became a part of the Lord's church. They became a part of that first church there, that first beginning. So when we're talking about here, uh, this uh, situation, when we're talking about, um, well, where we had our beginning, we know that that beginning came on the day of Pentecost. And so the apostles were preaching what? Through the apostles preaching about who or what? Then the people were saved. Well, they preached about Jesus Christ, didn't they? And through that preaching, it says, how many were saved? What's the number? Well, we read that too, didn't we? 3,000 people saved from their sins. 3,000 saved that day, as we uh, read. And from then on, they did what? Now, that, one's, that was a verse that we skipped but you can go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 and see this. We stopped at verse 41. Jump over to verse 42. What did they do in verse 42? They continued how? What did they do? They continued what? Dead fastly. And the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then as you read on, we see there were daily results. Now, if you turn... Uh, Turn back to uh, your Bibles over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 and watch this. What we find here, and I, we already read this a moment ago, they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now watch verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, see, such as should be saved. He added to the church daily. You know it? Now, that says something. When you talk about something happening, he says it was going on daily, wasn't it? Now, there were daily results. We'll go back to our question now. There were daily results. Why? The Lord added to the church daily those being saved. Why was it daily? Well, I think you know the answer. It was added daily because there, were da there was daily work going on. So by the time you get down to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, you see that there's a lot of things going on. It's no longer the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was from Acts chapter 2 to about verse 42, 43, right in there. And, and we could get back and get specific. But then you see him doing things day by day by day after this. And that's why you have a comment or, or, or a statement like this in 247, the Lord added to the church daily those being saved, there was daily results, my friends, because there was daily teaching going on. And we find the church growing in good and in bad times. Uh, when everyone was with them, you might say, and when everyone was against them. And so we find that the growth did not necessarily have to do with who uh, was in charge politically. Their growth did not have to do, well, like I said, 247 says they had favor with all men, but that wasn't going to last for long. And here pretty soon there's going to be people against them. Uh, first of all, the Jews, 
would be against them. The Sanhedrin, the rulers of the Jews and such, they didn't like what was going on. And they made that very, very clear. The Romans would be against them also as a people, and that's that will be later on down the line, but the Romans would be against them as well. And so uh, when you talk about that, it, it didn't matter what the outside world was doing. It didn't matter what uh, political party was in, in power. It didn't matter about that. The growth came through daily preaching, through daily prayers, through daily obedience, daily action. They just didn't give up and they didn't quit. And the good came from that, you know. They grew because of their consistency. So what would you say was consistent with them? What do you think about that? What do you think would be consistent with these people? I hope that we can see that that when it comes to their consistency. Again, consistent preaching, consistent in their obedience, consistent in their faith and love, and more on that. And just a lot of things they were doing that was right and godly, like it's supposed to be. These people started out very well. These people started out right. These people started out teaching and preaching the truth and living it. And they were blessed because of it, you know I'm going to go ahead and let's just drive a peg right here, if you will. We're going to stop and uh, we'll continue on, Lord willing, in our next uh, session, in our next class. And we'll talk about, uh, again, Jerusalem. We'll talk about lessons we can learn from them. And we'll talk about things that they teach us and make applications, more applications to ourselves, okay? Uh, it's just a very, very important study when we start talking about the different churches of the first century and talk about what they did, how they lived, what decisions they made, because, listen to me, we're going to see, and this is another reason why I want us to see kind of the background, the geography, some of the history, is I want you to see that these people are people just like you and me. They had the same issues, they had the same problems, they had the same temptations they had the same sins they had the same worries then they had the same victories and the same blessings and the same love and the same i mean it, it's it's uncanny i guess to see how close we really are to them but i want that to be a source of encouragement i want that to be something that we could look at and say yeah whenever i open my bible it doesn't it's not just uh words on a page these are real people who really live who really served God, who really loved God, who had real temptations, who really messed up sometimes, but there's also the same ones who did some wonderful things and blessed things and good examples for you and for me and for everyone. You know what? So let's remember that, okay? That's what it takes. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop, like I said, and, and I, I did forget, and so shame on me. We should have had a prayer at the beginning, and we didn't have it, but we're going to have a prayer right now. Let's pause for, for prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this day. We're so thankful for all the blessings you give to us. So thankful for the fact that you have given us the Bible. So thankful for the good examples we read about. But also thankful for bad examples because we learn what not to do just as much as we learn what to do from the good examples. So thankful that we can open up your word, that we can study, that we can find out what you'd have us to do, what you'd have us to be. So thankful for these many churches, these individual congregations that scattered throughout uh, the different continents and the fact that, that you have given us a written record of these folks. So we know how to live, we know how to act, and we know what pleases you as we study and as we read from these uh, from the book of Acts just as much as reading from the various epistles that are in the New Testament. So thankful for Jesus, for his great sacrifice, for his love. So thankful that through his sacrifice and death on the cross that we have salvation and that we can also be added to thy church. And we can be a part of it. So thankful for his blood that was shed to purchase the church. And so thankful for all thy many blessings. The wonderful thing we have in thee. And we're so thankful for this avenue of prayer as well. 
as you please be with us. We live from day to day that we'll live in a way be well pleased in the nice sight. That's all these things. In the name of thy son, Jesus. Amen. As I said, so thankful for our study. So thankful we could be together. I hope that this has been helpful and been encouraging to you. Until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.